Praise the Lord, Grace Apostolic Church. Praise the Lord. I wonder if you'd stand to your feet with me and give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. The Lord's been good, amen. The Lord's been good this week. I think we could give the Lord a better hand clap than that, amen. Amen. You know, in about an hour, about a couple of hours, there's going to be um, folks nationwide cheering on the Ravens, cheering on the 49ers and the Lions, you name it. But tonight, we have, this morning, excuse me, we have the ability to give praise to the Lord God who reigns forever in glory and in victory. We're giving praise that will echo into the heavens louder and greater than any stadium. Your praise is is higher and louder than 40,000 people gathered when you give it to the Lord. Amen. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord, whatever you have come in here with this morning. God is willing and able to meet you right where you are. If you need a touch in your body, you need a touch in your finances, you need a touch in your mind, I encourage you to come to the altar. I encourage you to lift your hands and worship and surrender to the Lord. And you will, you will find peace. Amen? Amen. If our elders and our ministers can make their way to the front, if you do have, as custom at Grace Apostolic, if you do have a need in your body, I encourage you to find an elder or a minister to pray with you this morning. But this morning we're going to pray together. And I encourage you after we pray to come down to this altar and to begin to worship the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your great love and your mercy. We are grateful, God, that you reign in all things, Lord. God, we are grateful, Lord, that you know the end from the beginning. And today, this morning, God, our praise, God, is going to equal greater heights, greater things, God, than anything else that we could possibly be doing right now. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your restoration. We thank you for your grace. And, Lord, we know without you, none of this matters. So this morning, we're going to give you our best praise. We're going to thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen and amen. I encourage you to make your way to the altar and worship with them as they sing. Oh, 
you just begin to lift up a praise to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords this morning, for he is truly high and lifted up. He is holy forever. The angels cry, holy, 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 day and night. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are holy today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. today, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless you forever, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Are you thankful today for his mercy and grace? I don't want to want to forget that. Hallelujah.
goodness of Jesus, there's nothing we cannot overcome. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. that will set you free. It's not family that will set you free. It's the name of the Lord Jesus and knowing who he is that will set you free today. excited that you know this isn't it we get to hear the word of the Lord we get to have an altar call that this isn't it this isn't the peak of the service but that's to come amen if 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 you're happy with what the Lord's done in your life give somebody a high five next to you as you make your way back to your seats say hey now look to your other side if you haven't seen somebody in a while and just 
say it's good to see them. Grandma Ruby, it's good to see you. <laughs> Amen. Woo. Amen. 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 I just have a, a, a few announcements. For all, uh, I, this is not only for the guys, but for the ladies too. The youth are, are doing a fundraiser selling chocolate covered strawberries. I encourage you, if you have not bought anything for your significant other, buy them chocolate covered strawberries in the lobby. You can go ahead and place an order. All that money goes directly to the youth to help the youth and also to help our students go to National Youth Convention uh, later on this year. So that's announcement number one, number two. This Friday is the Youth Ignite Rally at Turning Point Apostolic Church. I'm so excited for that. That's going to be at 7.30 p.m. with Reverend Anthony McCool. He will be coming into town to preach that. We're lucky that we get uh, Brother Anthony McCool to, to come here on Sunday. And he'll be preaching the word on Sunday as well here at Grace. Amen. The after event is going to be uh, $20, includes food, two hours of bowling, and fellowship. It's going to be a great time. Again, all those proceeds uh, go to not only pay for the bowling, but to benefit the Michigan District youth. And lastly, uh, ladies' conference is March 22nd and 23rd in Frankenmuth. Uh, registration is open. Please see Sister Melissa Smith, if you would raise your hand, and Sister Lana, if you would raise your hand. Uh, uh, there she is over there. If you uh, want to go to ladies' conference, I encourage you to see them. It's a great experience, great time with the Lord. Amen. Uh, I would just like to say thank you to all of our guests that are here. We have Zach and Kaylin. Thank you for, for coming. It's great to have you. We have Luke. Luke, where you at? Go ahead and raise your hand. I just saw him over here. There he is. If you would, would you stand to your feet, Luke, really quick? This is a remarkable young man from Troy, Athens. I am so glad that he's here. I'm grateful to call him friend. He's a remarkable guy. Thanks for being here, Luke. Haley, it's great to have Haley as well, all the way from Georgia. And we have Deanna and Sydney, so great to have you with us as well. And to all of our guests, thank you so much for choosing Grace Apostolic Church and being here. We are so grateful, and, and we have a lot going on, as you can see. And we just love to have you again and for you to call this place home. Amen. Uh, as Before we take up the offering, I'm going to hand this over to Pastor uh, for another announcement. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. One announcement I do want to make is starting in two Mondays from now, uh, as we did last year, we have a couples bowling league that we do for the month of February. Um, I do want to say that me and my wife won last year. Do not let that scare you away from joining this year's. Uh, we're a power couple, and it's hard to beat us. I understand that. Uh, but it's basically $15 a couple. Uh, it's for four Monday nights in a row. Uh, it's a great time for us to fellowship um, with each other. So that's for, obviously, February is Valentine's. Uh, month, so we do a couple's uh, bowling league on Monday here at, at Astro Lanes, I believe it's called right here by the church. If you want to join uh, us, let us know. Let Brother Shane know as well. He helps us coordinate uh, that as well. So if, you, if you're interested in that, it's going to be in two Mondays, so we need to know pretty quickly so we can let them know uh, what we're doing. It's a good time of fellowship on that Monday night together. Also, I do want to say this church is such a wonderful giving church, and uh, we're so thankful for the giving of this church. The reason we're blessed is because of the giving uh, not just at this church, but what my grandfather started years ago, giving towards missions, and, and those his heartbeat was for that. And we're so excited. We have an opportunity uh, for our church to represent uh, ministry in uh, South Africa and Zimbabwe. Uh, uh, Pastor Murray, Brother Murray, a missionary to South Africa, has asked uh, if we could have someone come down and do a youth uh, conference, teaching, preaching to young people in Zimbabwe. And I said, we, we'll look for that. And we've got, we've got some people that are interested in going. Uh, when, you, when I call your name, will you please stand up? Uh, Pastor Ramsey McCory, Brother A.J. Saber, Brother J. Lee Dowden. J. Lee, is he here? Brother J. Lee uh, Lincoln Traxley. He can't, he's already in the, uh, the drums. Um, uh, Pastor Wade Mitchell as well uh, is, is, is wanting to go as well. That, I think that's it, the five, five guys. This obviously has a cost uh, with it. Uh, and we're, we're asking that this church, over the next couple weeks, if you could, uh, maybe help us with the, the curbing the cost of this trip for these men to go. They're going to represent this church, preaching to young people. I think it's a great thing, great opportunity. You guys may be seated. Thank you, gentlemen, for this trip. It's going to be happening at the end of February, so it's, not, it's pretty quick. And so we're just asking if you could 
on your tithes envelope, whatever you do, or you can do it online. You can give online as well. Uh, if you in your box put money towards uh, the Africa trip, all that money will go to help take care of the costs for these families that are, are paying their way for this, that you could help us with that. So all the money that comes in will go immediately to the t on top of that cost and make it cheaper for them to go. Uh, because it is a sacrifice. I've been on many long flights. Uh, you don't do this because you, just want, you have a wanderlust and you just want to go see the, see the countries. You do it because there's a great ministry involved in this, and so it's great for our church. And so when we bless, bless them and give to that cause, we're going to be probably doing a, a couple of bake sales, maybe even a spaghetti dinner. We want to get that cost down. So I want to present to you that need. You can think about it, pray about it, and think about what you can give over the next couple weeks to help these men get to uh, Africa. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Amen. God is good to us. I'm glad I came to the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. If I didn't, if I, if I didn't attend church anywhere, I would go to this church. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Brother Roberto, you want to say something? Here's that. <laughs> Amen. 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 We're going to be receiving our tithing and offering. This is the way we give back to what the Lord has blessed us with. Um, we, we know if you're a guest, don't feel obligated to that, but we know there's joy in giving when we give it with a cheerful heart towards God. Amen? Amen. We're going we're to march. We're going to pray first and ask God's blessings over this part of our service. Let's pray at this time. Lord, we're so thankful today, Lord, for the, the, the wonderful presence that's already in this house. God, you've already touched people's lives already in the service. We're so thankful for a place that we can come and gather. We're asking, Lord, that you would touch the hearts of those people that go to the Grace Episode Church. They might be a, be a blessing to those going to Africa, Lord, for you see all people, all nations. And, Lord, we want to represent in this world, God, what you're doing in Grace Episode Church. We pray you bless this, this, this offering as we give it. We give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name pray. Amen. Please follow your ushers as you give today.
Come on, let's give him a great hand praise right now. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah for your goodness and for his mercy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. He's better to us than we are to ourselves. Amen. We love him. Amen. So greatly. Shake someone's hand next to you. Welcome in the house of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated for a few moments of time. God is so good to us. I want to just uh, quickly share um, Brother James Grains. His, he's like a quick testimony here. Off the spot, he has no idea I'm doing this. Quick testimony for this week. Tell us what happened. So uh, it, it comes up now and again, but I did get baptized last year. And, uh, and at that time, my sight was restored. You know, I was legally blind. So now I've gone through the whole process. I've gone to see all the doctors, and I've done all the stuff. And in fact, I went, uh, went to Secretary of State and got my license back. <laughs> Woo! And that's what's up. Got myself a car two days later. And so today was my first time driving people to church. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you that van is going to have people in it every time I come to church. I ain't driving in it alone. Got to bring more souls. All about the souls. All about the souls, and that's it. Got to bring more souls. It doesn't matter how many. It doesn't matter who they are. You got to get the souls in here. You got to bring them to church, baby. You got to bring those souls into church. Come on now. Help me out. Let's go. Come on, let's go. Amen. 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 Awesome testimony God's done. Luke chapter 16. I just told Brother James, I said, man, I'm so excited for you. I'll just be off the roads for about a week or so and let you get, get back in the <laughs> I said, the gas on the right, brakes on the left, but he passed with flying colors, and we're so glad about that, what the Lord has done. What an awesome modern-day miracle he is. Amen. Just, just the fact that you're here, you're a miracle today as well. I you may, it might not be as obvious, and people may not pat you on the back or clap their hands for you being here, but with all the devil is thrown against you, yet you're here today, uh, you're a miracle in the eyes of God. Amen. I'm so glad that you're here today. Amen. If you don't attend church anywhere, we'd love to have you 
uh, learn more about Grace Apostolic Church. I think you said it. There's a lot. There's a, a gift for any first-time guests here today. Uh, just say thank you for being here, and uh, we'll give that to you and just tell you a little more about the church. We do have a new a new logo that we're working on that we've got going. We're going to be doing revamping our our look a little bit just with a new logo, and our website's going to be updated. So we're excited about all those things. They're important, amen, in our in our generation. Uh, just just the marketing of, of the church. If people, like I say, if people knew what was happening inside here, if they only knew. So that's what we do uh, with our, our marketing, our, our website. So Luke chapter 15, verse um, <clears throat> number 11, 15, verse number 11, Jesus speaking. He said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there a, arose a, a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before thee I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. What a beautiful story. And the son said to his father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight no, no worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and his, is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Beautiful story of saving grace. Jesus telling us the story. I want to talk to you a little bit on the subject, simply two sons. Two sons. The father. The Bible says the father, certain man, had two sons. And one son gets a lot of attention and the second son doesn't get as much attention. But I want to talk to you about the two sons this man had. I'm going to say, man, reading the word, <clears throat> maybe see the name of the Lord Jesus. I meant two brothers, whatever. Two brothers, two sons. They're both sons, they're both brothers. Amen. <laughs> True to his parable of the man who made a great supper, where only the rejected of society were willing to respond to God's gracious invitation, so it was in reality among the crowd where Jesus would be. It was unpopular publicans and sinners that were always willing to accept the gracious words and fellowship of Jesus Christ, while the religious elite, the church people, objected to Jesus' reception of these outcasts. In Luke chapter 15, in your own time, you can read it yourself, you'll find that Jesus tells three parables in a row. One is about a lost sheep, one is about a lost coin, and the third one is about the lost son. They all follow the same theme, which was something of extreme value was lost, an intensive search was made for that lost item, and the finder of that item rejoiced with others over finding that which was lost. All three parables were used to explain why Jesus sought out such morally suspect company, people that others rejected, those that wouldn't look twice, those that would never be uh, invited to get-togethers, those that remained in the streets, but Jesus tells a story to tell us in God's eyes they were of great worth, yet they were desperately lost people. Though the common people rejected them, Jesus saw great value in them. How many can think over their own life, and you could look through the, the history of your own personal dealings with God and say that that was me. I was the undesirable. I was the outcast. I was the one that people thought there was no hope. And those, those that can say that they're the honest people. They're the, they're, they're the ones that have not grown so sanctimonious in the pew that they can't remember that if it wasn't for the Lord on their side, 
they would be lost. The truth is, all of us were lost. All of us were without hope. I don't care if you were born into the Pentecostal ranks. Listen, we were all on our way to a devil's hell. We're all lost. There's nobody better or worse in God's kingdom. All of us were without hope. And the truth is, as bad off as we were, there was no whole lot of people trying to track us down to help us get out of our situation. We were in despair. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. On our best day, we were without hope. On our best day, we were on our way to an eternal hell. And how many people would be willing to give God praise that can realize and say, in spite of my pitfall situation, I have a God that saw great value in me. Although I had nothing to offer him, I serve a God that saw something remarkable in me. My mom and dad didn't see it. My brothers and sisters couldn't see it. But I've got a God in heaven that saw something of redemption in me. So much so that the Bible says in Romans 5 and 8, God commendeth his love towards us in that while, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In spite of our evil ways, Jesus made an investment in us. Do you know that he hung on a cross, not for righteous people, but for desperately lost people. Guess what? That was every single one of us. That's why when you want to know why we're excited, uh, why we clap our hands, uh, why we stand to our feet, uh, it's because we had nothing to offer. We were desperate. Uh, we were unrighteous. Uh, we were unlovable. But Jesus Christ gave everything uh, that we might be saved uh, and freed from the chains of sin uh, that were on our lives. That's why we love him today. But of the three parables, I focus on the third and probably the most preached on parable of the three that Jesus speaks about, the prodigal son. It is, in fact, a beautiful story of separation, of loss, of surrender, of revelation, of returning, and restoration. And it has been used as it should be as a story of hope to anyone that has ever lost their way. For anyone who has made bad choices and you find yourself in a pig pen of sin and disgrace and you, you, you can't live with yourself and you're wondering to yourself, and I'm sure some of us have, how did I ever get to the place where I am right now? When I left Father's house, this was never a place I intended to be. How did my thoughts get so skewed? How did my actions get so just disgraceful? I don't like where I am. How did I get here? Guess what? It doesn't matter how you got there. It doesn't matter the bad choices that you took to get to where you are. The only thing you need to know is you have a father that waits every day for your return. And you can't get back home because if you've got breath in your body, you still got hope. It doesn't matter what you did last night. I'm telling you, there's a father that's waiting to re return you back to the place that you left him. That's all I need to know. It doesn't matter how bad my life was. I just know there's a God that still loves me. There's a God that's got redemption for me. There's a God. There does, however, in this in the story of redemption, seem to be a lost message in the story that I want to dig out and unpack here for a few moments. To me, the story that we don't often talk about is just as important as what seems to be the main theme, which is grace of a lost son. And it starts, if you find out what the story is, it starts out by finding out why Jesus is telling the story in the first place and who he's telling the story to. It's important to get context. You can be way off on scripture if you don't understand context of why it's being spoken and who is being spoken to. So let's, let's look at this chapter 15 of St. Luke, verse one through three. 
Then drew, draw, drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Verse number three. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, It was the actions of the Pharisees that caused Jesus to speak these parables that he spoke. Who is the audience? It's important to know who the audience is. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, those that could not endure the fact that Jesus claims to be a religious man, but he hangs out with sinful people. Jesus focused all these parables was not on uh, the publicans and sinners so much as it was for the self-righteous religious people. See, the, the, the prodigal story of the prodigal often dwells on one son, but it's very clear that, that he had a brother, and this man had two sons. This story really is an admonishment and a rebuke to the Pharisees and the scribes. Well, what do you try to tell us? What do you mean by the story? What do you try to tell us here? Well, you had a lost son. We know who they are. But the other, the man had another son, and that's not really talked about as much. But I'm going to tell you about what the story is all about. Yes, that's still going on. Look, look, look at the situation. Jesus is telling the story about the son's return. And look at what happens, verse number 25, the remainder of the story. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf. Because he had received him safe and sound, and he did not celebrate with his father, but rather, the Bible says, and he was angry. We see this pharisaical spirit shine through with the second brother when he hears of the celebration of his lost brother and the welcome party he has. And instead of joining in with the celebration, this brother grows angry at his father for receiving such a person back into his home. His brother had partied his father's savings away. He disgraced their family name. He's only back in the, oh, here we go. He's only back in the father's house because he doesn't really love dad. He just has nowhere else to go. <laughs> he doesn't really want to be in church. He just knows the church is going to give him some money. You know, he just has no place to be. That's, he doesn't really love dad anyways. And as soon as he gets a couple dollars in his pocket, he's going to be gone again. What's the point? What's the point in love? I mean, you can't even, he doesn't even want to be here. His spirit isn't even right. But what the older brother doesn't know is about the conversation the younger brother had within his own heart before he ever got to the father's house. See, you, you, can't, you can't understand people just because you see what they see on the outside and you don't know how hard it was where they were to say, you know what, I'm wrong here. The Bible said he came to himself and came humbly to the father and said, I don't even, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. And he shows up at father's house and the older brother just ticked that he's there. Jesus talking about the Pharisees here. The religious crew, they, he's so angry. His brother has just, just squandered everything. I was, I was talking to my daughter last night about this story. What mess is this? I was telling her about, you know, about the brother that wasn't kind to his brother and how he wastes his way. And she was, I'd be angry at Lincoln, too, if he did all that stuff. So she really needs a sermon today. She's not right in her spirit right now. But that's in our flesh. We understand if you give someone a chance and they fail over and over at some point, like, I'm writing this guy off. He doesn't, if, if you, listen, if they don't want it, you can't give it to them. And so I can see that. I, I guess what it happens in our church in 2024. You deal with people, oh, no, no, here I go again. I'm going to deal with, you know, it's, just, it's an attitude we have towards these people. 
and we get into our heart and we're so upset. I can't rejoice over someone like that. I can't rejoice to see someone come down to the altar again knowing I know what they know. I know their backstory. I know they'll probably be gone next week. We won't see them again and they'll come back boo-hoo and cry. All these things go through your mind. And I'm going to tell you right now, if this is your spirit towards people that are repeat offenders, if this is your attitude towards those that keep crawling their way back to the altar, I'm going to tell you what God's going to do. God's going to send 20 people like that into this church to either change your spirit or you got to change churches. Because the bottom line is nobody has the authority to say who deserves grace and who doesn't deserve grace. I say as often as they come back to the house of God, I want to celebrate that they came back one more time. Oh God, change my spirit towards how I see souls. Nobody has the authority to say whether or not they get God's grace. Guess what? Those are God's kids. You don't have the right to say they don't belong here. That's God's problem. That's God's business. You just love them when they get here and let God restore them as he wants to. This isn't in my notes. But I'm glad the father didn't die in the process of the brother coming home. Because had the good father passed away, the older brother would have been in charge. And there would have been a locked gate at the, at the driveway saying, sorry, son. Sorry, bro. We gave you an opportunity. You're lost. Be very careful that we don't let fleshly leadership, fleshly things in our church. Not just leadership, but in people in church. That you do the whole side eye, right? We know that side eye. When someone walks in. And you know their story. They've been here before. And you're like, you know, here it is again. And we get that in our spirit, in our church. Instead of rejoicing, we've had people leave. Because you, you, we, we welcome people that have, you know, broken people. We welcome them. How could you do that? How could you? Well, you need to be out here. We, we can't have that spirit here. If you have to go somewhere else and worship, that's fine. But that's not what Grace Epsilon does because that's what the Bible teaches us to do. So he's so, he's so upset with this. But. The crux is, and then this is where we go, this is where I want to dive into the next part of this, this lesson. The crux of the whole story is found in verse number 29 when the, the older brother talks to his father. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. I've served you all these years. The Pharisees and the Sadducees put a lot of emphasis on outside works. Their self-sacrificing service to God. But they never had any real relationship with God at all. We need to restore among the religious people the art of true relationship with Jesus Christ. Verse 29, I serve you all these years. See, the reason the other brother can't rejoice and the reason he's so angry is because he personally had lost his identity while in the father's house. The problem that the older brother had is he saw his father as his boss. All that his father was was just a boss to be worked for. Verse 25, interesting now, his older son was in the field. Don't we talk about working in God's field? How many people have lost their soul because their service in the field was for a boss and not a God they loved and a father they worshiped? How could that pastor just quit? How could that evangelist just quit? How could that 
Missionary just quit because they've got lost in the field. Because it was just like any other job instead of a calling by a loving Savior that poured into them, they might pour into others. And they lost their identity while in the field. Something tragic happens when we see God as upper management. And when you see God as upper management, someone you work for, you just live life and serve him, going through life just checking boxes for a boss. You work for someone, you stand around the punch clock, and you, I think you still have punch cards in there. You punch in, and then you punch out. And you maybe go there five minutes early, just wait till the clock, just punch out and punch in. You already quit your job, you just punch in, punch out. And you never think about that job again until you have to punch back in. And how many people that lose their sonship or daughtership identity to Jesus have turned their walk with God into a punch card? You show up on Sunday, get your pat on the back, I did this, I read my scriptures. And then when someone else comes in, the church is excited. We say, he didn't even get excited about me when I pray like that. What's going on here? And you can't rejoice in, in, in new ones or even returning ones. Because yourself are out of whack with where you should be with God. Because when, you, when you're like the Father, when you have the Father's love on you, you love what the Father loves. That, that's why it's hard for me to, 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 to stomach self-righteous apostolics. been there a long time. They want to they apologize for how people look, and they want to apologize for what people do. Listen, you don't apologize for that. That's the heartbeat of Jesus Christ. Give, give me every person you can find. Give me someone that say, may say a cuss word. Give me someone that may be bound by drugs. Give me someone that's lost and hopeless. Guess what? That's the heartbeat of Jesus. That's why Jesus died, not just for righteous people, but he died for all people. So they're really, brother had lost his identity. Something happens. The things we do in our walk with God, if we lose our identity with God, the things we do in our walk with God, we do because we think God expects it. Or what we do, do is done to keep God happy. Well, I got to go to church. If I don't, then God's going to be angry at me. And you kind of were talk, stepping on this this morning about how we, how we see God. Or we say, oh, I'm so glad I get to serve the Lord all these years. That's the problem. You're serving him. That's all you see him as, someone to be served. Like, like, like God wants your service. Like God's waiting, like he's waiting for you to just come to him with a golden tray and say, Lord, here's all your, he already served us at the cross. He, he doesn't need you. I'm so glad I serve the Lord all these years. Listen, and if this is how we see God, there's no wonder why we've lost our joy in what we do. No wonder why reading our Bible is a chore and not a love. Because when you stop seeing Jesus as daddy, but you see him as boss, his book becomes a bunch of rules instead of what it really is, a love letter to his children. The elder brother had lost his identity. He was living a life of service and not out of relationship. It's interesting what Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 6 and 9 to pray. Pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Philip says, show us the Father, and this suffices us. Philip, have you been, have been so long with you, you don't know who I am. When you see me, we're, we're not talking about some sort of galaxy God out there in the outer banks where no one can know him. He loved us so much that that father wrapped himself in flesh just because he wanted to bounce babies on his knee and wrap his arms around sinners. I, I'm telling you, that's the God you serve. He's not angry with you. He doesn't want to zap you. Every time you fail, you've got a God that wants to gather up his children as a chicken gathers her hands together. But you just got to know that you're loved by God. God is not the big boss in the sky. He's our father. He's the lover of our soul. He gave his life so that we could live. He doesn't want your service. He wants your heart. 
And the elder son had lost his heart towards his father. When we can see God as our father, we don't have to beg people to join us for prayer. We just are so happy to come to the church to pray to the one that loved us and redeemed us and called us by name and knows the number of hairs on his head, the God that his eyes go to and fro throughout the earth looking to bless somebody, just look, looking to be a good dad. Jesus said, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more your heavenly father, he wants to be a father. You're looking at him the wrong way. You're looking at him as an angry boss. And if you don't do it right, he's going to write you off. God will never write you off. People may write you off, but God will never write you off. The sad part of this prodigal story is the father had two sons. One was lost in the pig pen. That was obvious. It was easy to see. But the problem was the other son was lost in his father's field, and he didn't even know it. He was in the right place, doing the right thing, every day like his father. Maybe he had asked him. But he was just as lost as his brother in the pig pen, yet he sat on the pew every Sunday. Came to church on Wednesday. But he had no relationship. And he was there out of obligation. See, remember, this parable that Jesus tells was for the church members the religious people. Jesus wasn't fooled by the Pharisees' outward show. No one else was bold enough to say it, but Jesus said, you're hypocrites. If the publicans and sinners are the first son, he makes a huge statement. See, the prodigal came to himself and realized I'm lost, and he changed his ways and ran back to the father's house. The publicans and sinners realized they were lost. They knew they were the outcast, so they needed Jesus. Yet the elder son was lost in the field and did not even know he needed to change. This hit me pretty hard last night when I was preparing this thought because I, I put myself in that situation that oftentimes the role of relationship, especially in leadership, the role of relationship to Jesus as my personal Savior, my God, and what I do for him in the church, sometimes bump lines. And all of a sudden, you start thinking, this is my job, this is what is expected of me, instead of saying, man, I, I want to do this because I love him. And I never want to lose the identity of the fact, before I was ever a pastor, I was his child. Before I was ever called into ministry, I was his, his kid. And I just, I remember loving to be next to my bed, just open up my Bible and just reading a scripture and praying and pouring my heart out to God. But I don't want to lose that sensitivity and go through life doing what he expects but never doing it out of relationship because I just, I've lost my identity. I'm speaking to the church today. Just because you're working in the Father's field does not mean you're okay with the Father. Just because you're a Sunday school teacher, a leader, just because you're a praise team member, all these things that you do for God does not mean you're right with God. This is a heart check today. How are you looking at Jesus today? How do you see him? Do you see him as a far away God that you just have to pray to because if you don't, he's going to be upset and or do you see him as a father that you're everything? That without him you'd be lost and to think that how, just how your life could be without his mercy and grace on your life. If you've lost your joy in what you do, you better find it again. If Jesus has become an obligation to you, you're, you're the older brother. They sing a song, he's not a burden to me. He's not a burden to me. But even to our older brother, I love the story. It, does, it ends wonderfully. If we all stand to our feet. The other brother, the Pharisees, are kicking and screaming. They're upset. 
They don't like the way dad handled things. And the father could tell his son was out of place. And the father says, well, if you don't like my rules, go hit the street, go pound sand, go do something else. Doesn't do that. See, as much mercy as the father had for a wayward son, he had for a lost son in the house. Because he's fair. He's not fair. He's actually towards us more than he should be, probably. But he's fair. And so what does the father do? He grabs this, this angry brother around the shoulders and brings him close and has a little talk with him. Verse number 31 and he said unto him, Son, son, if you haven't heard it in a while, I apologize, but I want you to hear my son. Thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. See, when you lose your identity with who you are with Jesus, and you forget that everything, you get to experience this all week, all, all the time. You get the blessings of your Father. That when you know that, and you know how much He loves you, when someone else comes in and you see them as a repeat offender, or someone that's lost trust or whatever it is, you can rejoice. Because you know they're missing out on what you get to experience every day being a son of God. And so when that, that prodigal comes back, you're the first one to wrap your arms around them because that's what your daddy would do. That's what your father would do. And if you can't rejoice in the things that your father rejoices in, you better line your relationship back up with that wonderful spirit because he loved you enough that when you were doing wrong and when you didn't have a prayer, when you didn't have anyone on your back, you had a God that lovingly wooed you back. Come on, he wooed you back. He, he loved you enough. He didn't give up on you. Come on, let's not give up on someone else. Let's not give up on someone else. We've got a daddy in heaven. We've got an Abba Father. We've got someone that's so gracious. Let that graciousness of God be the anthem by which grace apostolic church lives under. Some of you need to be reminded again that you are his son, that you are his daughter. You've forgotten it in the busyness of life and raising kids, working your job. You forgot what it's all about. It's not about what I have to do. It's the fact that I get to have a relationship. The amazing thing was the prodigal said, I don't deserve to be called your son. I'm willing to swap my identity with a servant. And here, the older brother had sonship the whole time, but he felt like he was just a servant to the Father, Grace Apostolic Church. Let that not be how you pray. Let that not be how you fast or how you seek God. But oh, would we just find ourselves back at the feet of Jesus, saying, Lord, I'm not your servant. I, I'm, not, I'm better than your friend. I'm your son. I'm your daughter. And I have a right to be here today. I wonder as we get ready to sing, as these altars are open, if we could just come to him this way. Lord, I don't want to be a religious elite. I don't want to be closed off. I don't want to be judgmental, God. But I want to see you as you see me. I want to see you as my father. I've lost my identity, but oh God, you can bring it back. I've missed you, son. I've missed you, daughter. I just want to talk to you today. Come on, he's not a God that's angry. He's a God that's redeeming. He's a God that's sensitive. He's a God that's loving. He's a God that knows your name. He knows where you live. He knows your ups and downs. He knows your good days, your bad days. And he does not write you off as his child. Come on, we got some older brothers that need to realign with Jesus right now. We've got some older brothers and sisters right now that you need to rely on. But I've heard the tender whisper of Come on, don't forget your identity today. Don't forget who you are in the eyes of God. That you're pleased and that I'm never alone. Oh, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Come on, you are not 
a servant. You are not a servant, you're a son. You're a daughter.
love so much.